Hello, this is a uh, video reply to some questions from a, a student in uh, Lisbon, in Portugal. Um, I've got about six questions to answer. I'll try and answer them um, in a way that they can be split up if needed. So the first question is, in a digital context, what should journalists understand as data? I think it's really important that journalists see data not just in spreadsheets and statistics. Um, it's very easy to think of data as numbers, as, as traditional spreadsheet type information, but actually data is much, much more than that. When you put things online, everything becomes data, everything becomes digitized, and that means that you can analyze things that aren't necessarily already in spreadsheets or aren't necessarily statistics or even numbers. You can analyze those things in quantitative ways. So the most uh, common example that most people are familiar with is the word cloud. A word cloud is a way of looking at text as data, looking at things like speeches or official documents and turning that into numbers, counting the frequency of those words. You can do the same things with images, with the colours in images, things like that. So you can look at which colours appear most often, as one person has done with Van Gogh paintings. You can look at sounds, you can look at connections between people on social media, uh, what's called network analysis. Uh, you can look at weather, you can look at music. So there are all sorts of really fascinating possibilities around data, and I think it's, it's important that journalists realize that almost anything that's been digitized can be looked at as data. It doesn't mean you have to, but it means that there's a possibility of doing so. And the second question is, what skills are necessary for a communication professional to distinguish in the amount of data? What is good and bad information? In other words, how do we tell what data is good and what data is bad? The most important thing for me in looking at data is that journalists should always treat it as any other source. So if you interview someone and they make a claim to a particular fact or a particular event, then you need to check that with a second source or you need to see if there's some way that you can verify that information. Now data, it might look more authoritative, but that doesn't mean it is. In the same way as you shouldn't necessarily trust someone because they happen to be a government employee or a very senior person um, or even an academic, you should always treat data with the same scepticism as you would treat any source. So you need to think about what's the vested interest of the source of this data. This data doesn't just happen um, without any context. It's, it's gathered by humans. It might be selected by humans and presented by humans, even automatically generated data. If you look at things like um, Twitter behavior, you know, Twitter uh, users select themselves and their communication is selected in certain ways. There is still human intervention there. So you should always treat any data as you would treat any source. I don't think it's, I don't think you can see, say that this data is, is true and this data is false, and this is how you tell the difference. Um, you should look at um, statistical context, so how big is the sample size, if it's based on samples of individuals, um, over what period has it been collected, what factors might have influenced the collection of that, so if you have um, holidays or elections or um, you know, the, the economy uh, has problems, unemployment rises, those sorts of contexts. Um, you should look at um, how representative that sample is of the wider population that you're trying to talk about. You should put it into context in terms of the, how big that population is. So you should always check, you know, who is the source, how is it being collected, those sorts of things. And you know, if it's from a press officer, then obviously they have a vested interest, but also if it's from an official organisation, they might um, classify things in certain ways. Classification is very important to look at as well. Moving on to question three, how is it possible to verify data journalism? Um, 
Well, I, I think um, there's a distinction here between verifying the data itself, perhaps. Um, so I'll go back to the point, which is that you should treat data as any other source, and you should seek second sources and third sources sometimes to check the truth of that data uh, or the reliability of that data. And often, crime's a good example. If you're looking at crime, you have uh, in the UK two main sources of data. You have crime which has been reported, so that, that's people reporting it to the police, and you have crime, uh, what's called a crime perceptions survey or experiences of crime. So this is a separate piece of, of research, which is where people are asked if they have had experience of crime. Because often people experience crime but do not report it. So those are two separate pieces of data, and they will give you different pictures in terms of how uh, much of a problem theft is or burglary or, or whatever. Um, and, you, and you want to be aware that they both have limitations and both have problems. You also need to be aware with crime generally, there's a lot of victimless crime which will not be reported to the police and it will probably not come up in surveys either in terms of people's experiences of crime. So white collar crime, things like tax evasion, tax avoidance, that's not going to come up in those, um, in those sorts of surveys. So in terms of verifying data journalism itself, you obviously want to look at uh, whether the journalist has linked to the original source of the information, um, whether it's possible for you to check that original data. Uh, and again, all the same considerations with looking at data itself. Um, who is the source? How is it being gathered? Uh, what's the vested interest here? Have they, uh, if they're going for a big number story, if they're telling a story which is just about how many millions has been spent or how many billions or how many thousands of crimes, then it's quite likely that there isn't that much of a story here because if you take any big number out of context, it might sound surprising. But put in the context of the complete budget or the complete number of crimes or the historical pattern of, of crime, it may not be that surprising. So always be wary of, of stories that just have a big number rather than a percentage or an increase or decrease or a per person figure. Question four, you ask about um, how should you apply storytelling to data journalism? Um, I think, again, we're, we're in a period where data journalism as a, as a genre is really still in its infancy. And a lot of the data journalism that I see is very focused on the numbers and the facts and the big picture. And that's really important in journalism. But in terms of storytelling, it's often not very compelling. If you want to tell a good story, if you want people to listen to what is important, an important fact or revelation, then you need to relate that to human beings. So I think it's really important in, in telling the story that data journalism might throw up, that you have a human element. And I always say that a good story should answer two questions. It should tell us, why should I care and why does this matter? Now, data journalism <coughs> of data itself is often very good at telling us why this matters. It can tell us that things are going up, that things are getting worse, that hundreds of thousands of people are being affected. That will tell us why it matters, but it does not tell us why we should care. Why should I care that a million people died if I can't relate to them? So the other part of, the, of, the, uh, of a good story why does this, why should I care, is about having a human case study, some individual that has been affected by this issue that you're looking at in terms of data. And often you open the story with that, often you open with that case study and then um, talk about the bigger picture that the data gives you. And likewise, if you're doing maps, if you're doing things like that, then you want some, some human stories as part of that. Now, also in storytelling, I think it's important to have quotes, not just from a case study, but from experts, from people who can add extra detail to the numbers. If your story is just all the numbers that you found, or the, you know, things from background reports and research, 
then again, it's not likely to be as compelling as if you have picked up the phone or gone out and spoken to an expert who can add the detail to that and the context. It also means you will know more as a journalist and you can avoid mistakes that sometimes an expert can point out to you. The fifth question asked here is, um, what's the importance of open access? Open access, open data, if you like, or access to information laws is tremendously important, uh, not just in journalism, but in, in civic society and in the relationship between citizens and power and government. Um, I say power because it isn't necessarily always government. So having access to information about what our taxes are being spent on, um, how they're being spent, whether they're being spent effectively, um, also what problems there are in society and whether we should be spending money on those. That is absolutely vital to how government operates, to how we as a society function effectively. If things aren't working, if money is not being spent, and remember it is our money, if that's not being spent effectively or appropriately, then we need to know about that. And, and often, you know, citizens can help with that. So, um, so it's very important in that sense. And journalists are obviously one of the main groups of people who are able to draw attention to problems either in money being spent wrongly or areas where money should be spent because there are changes and change is news. Um, so I, I, I think that's really important and particularly important as public services are often outsourced to private companies. So it, it's important that we have access to that information, whether it is held by a public body or by a private uh, company which is delivering those public services using public money. And also more broadly, it's important that uh, powerful corporations are required to publish certain information um, accounts are a very good example of this. You know, companies are required to publish accounts in uh, many countries, uh, which allows journalists and stockholders to, again, hold them to account to check that they're operating effectively. Um, so uh, those sorts of things, I think, also help us make effective decisions in making society work well. The sixth question is, what online tools are available for a journalist to select, aggregate, analyse and disseminate information? Um, well, in terms of selecting information, obviously uh, you have search engines um, and advanced search techniques are particularly important in being able to find data quickly. So it's, it's important that journalists are able to um, specify that they want spreadsheets or PDFs in their search results or they want to limit search results to a certain type of site or uh, date range. That's, um, you know, worth emphasising. There are also specialist search engines that allow you to just search tables. Zanran is one, and Google has its own um, tables search search engine, which is separate to the main Google site. Uh, in terms of once you've got that data, I think Open Refine which used to be called Google Refine. Open Refine is a very, very useful tool in cleaning and combining data. Um, often overlooked, really. It doesn't get as much credit or mention as it should because it, it does some very simple things extremely well. First of all, if you have data in an unusual format like XML or JSON, Open Refine can import that and convert it into a spreadsheet that you can analyze. If you have a number of different spreadsheets that you need to combine, for example, spending for each month of the year, then OpenRefine can combine those into one file. If you have one uh, spreadsheet workbook, which has a number of sheets within it, you know, one again for each month of the year, for example, or each region of the country, then again, OpenRefine will combine that. And it also will remove empty rows and do other cleaning functions. But even those basic combining and converting uh, functions are very, very useful to be able to use. So Open Refine, I'm a massive fan of. In terms of analysing the data, well obviously spreadsheets are often the first part of Colver. It's worth knowing 
all the um, techniques available, but even if you don't remember them, and I don't think you should expect to memorize every technique, if you're aware of what spreadsheets can do, um, pivot tables are a very good example of this. Pivot tables are one of the first skills I think a, a journalist, a data journalist should learn. Then you can always find out, you can Google, how do I do this in Excel? Um, or Google Sheets or other spreadsheet software. Um, and, and I wrote a book about this, um, Finding Stories in Spreadsheets, which is essentially a recipe book of all the different functions that you can use and all the different problems that you can solve in Excel and how to do that. So in terms of analysis, that's uh, an obvious skill to have. But beyond Excel, if you've got a very big data set, then it's worth learning SQL, SQL. This is a, a language, it's a structured query language for querying data. Um, the difference between that and Excel is that it operates very quickly and it operates on very large files uh, because you're not running software, you're um, running a query on the data itself. So SQL is well worth exploring. There's a, a plugin for Firefox called SQLite uh, which allows you to have a play around with that and get used to how that works. Um, so that's analysis in terms of disseminating information, in terms of telling the story. As I've said, I think it's important to remember that um, the human side of the story is often very important. It doesn't have to be a visualization. Um, that's not always the best way to tell the story. So first of all, identify what is the best way to tell the story. And then in terms of tools, well, in mapping, you have um, Batch Geo, uh, which is a very uh, good way of generating a quick map. You don't have much control over that, but it's very easy to learn. Um, beyond Batch Geo, there's a tool called Open Heat Map, which allows you to um, uh, create shapes rather than points for maps if you have a data set which relates to um, a set of areas that that site has, things like UK constituencies, Mexican regions and so on. Um, so those are two very good entry level mapping tools. Google Fusion Tables is very powerful and, and well worth exploring. It gives you a lot of control. Uh, and that, uh, Cartor DB, sorry, Cartor DB is also well worth looking at. I think Cartel DB is starting to overtake Fusion Tables as the mapping tool of choice for many journalists, partly because um, it deals with some things more quickly, I think, than Fusion Tables. If you have shapes, then it's um, in some ways it's uh, easier to use. You can do SQL queries inside it. You can do different types of maps. Um, and you can embed in WordPress, which is a major advantage to Cartel DB. So that's just mapping in terms of charts. Well, um, you have Tableau. Tableau um, is a free piece of software. There's also a paid version. Um, this will generate maps as well, but primarily it does lots of charts. It's, it's very powerful, but that means it takes more time to learn. So it's also worth exploring some of the easier online tools like um, Data Wrapper. Data Wrapper it was designed for journalists um, and allows you to create bar charts and pie charts, line charts, donut charts, uh, the basic charts that you really need. Plotly, P-L-O-T-L-Y, is another that does um, something very similar. And uh, Infogram, which uh, is for infographics, but again will do certain types of charts um, that you uh, may need. My tea is going cold. So um, uh, those are all you know, various chart tools. There are lots of others out there. It's worth looking at some of the um, JavaScript libraries if you want real interactivity and control. D3 uh, is one of the most widely used JavaScript visualization libraries. But there are lots of others as well, like Leaflet for mapping. Um, uh, Fact Mint, which is very easy to use. Fact Mint uh, will convert a table into whatever chart you want to specify. So I could go on and on. There are so many tools out there for, for communicating data stories, um, uh, even involving 
uh, timelines, for example, timeline JS. Thing link will turn a, a, an image into an interactive image, so you can add hotspots. Um, I'm trying to think what the um, story map is another one, which where you've got a, a map combined with a timeline, essentially. Dipity does something very similar. So <clears throat> there are so many creative possibilities in terms of telling stories. The key thing is to start with the story. Don't start with a tool. Don't decide you're going to do something spectacular if the story doesn't suit it. Don't use a map if the map doesn't actually tell a story. Um, so that really wraps up um, all the tools I can think of. So hopefully that was useful. Um, and I'll stop there.